Uh, good evening from Hong Kong, everyone. Uh, my name is Mara Malagori. I am an assistant professor at CUHK Law, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this online seminar on constitutional law in Greater China Comparative Issues. The seminar is part of an event series of the Comparative Constitutional Law Research Forum here at the CUHK Law Center for Comparative and Transnational Law. Today we have presentations by three of my formidable CUHK law colleagues. Um, Stuart Hargraves, who is Associate Professor uh, here at CUHK Law. Raya Mitchell, who is Assistant Professor at CUHK Law. And uh, Bui Son, who is Assistant Professor uh, here with us. Today, my wonderful colleagues will introduce their ongoing work as co-editors of their Routledge Handbook of Constitutional Law in Greater China. This handbook aims to provide a comprehensive survey of important issues in constitutional law in mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, and critically discuss leading views on these issues. I'm pleased to announce that my colleagues have secured the book contract with Routledge for this project, and the expected publication date is late 2022, so watch out for the book. Unfortunately, Professor Hare Graves is unable to join us live, but we have a pre-recorded presentation by him. Uh, for the Q&A sessions, I will collect questions from the Zoom chat for Professor Zbui and Professor Ryan. If you have questions for Professor Hargraves, feel, feel, please feel free to email him directly. Uh, I also wanted to re remind you that this event is being recorded. And without further ado, I would like to ask my colleagues uh, to play the recording uh, by Professor Hargraves. Hi, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to my presentation. My apologies for not being able to deliver this to you um, live, as it were, but unfortunately I had a bit of a personal emergency involving childcare. Um, the use of non-nationals as judges on a jurisdiction's apex court is unusual, but not unprecedented. And today I want to talk about the law uh, as it relates to those kinds of judges in both Macau and in Hong Kong, I'm focusing in particular on the question of uh, whether or not they ought to hear national security cases. A number of very small or very poor states have long used imported judges as a means of overcoming severe capacity limitations in their homegrown legal talent. This is the case in a number of the microstates of the South Pacific, for instance. Uh, overseas judges are also sometimes used in post-conflict scenarios as part of the reconciliation process. The 1960 Constitution of Cyprus, for instance, um, attempted to manage tensions between the Turkish and Greek Cypriot communities by creating a Supreme Constitutional Court that included one judge from a neutral third country. A similar approach was taken in post-conflict Bosnia and Herzegovina. There, the constitution specifies that three members are to be selected by the president of the European Court of Human Rights and may not be citizens of either Bosnia or any other neighboring state. Macau's basic law explicitly provides that, quote, foreign judges may be employed, providing that they are suitably qualified. In practice, of course, Portuguese language requirements mean that any such foreign judges are typically drawn from a relatively small number of other locations. Furthermore, the majority of these foreign judges are in fact long-term Macau residents, and this is very different, as I will explain, from the role that the overseas judges in Hong Kong play, um, because it means that even if some of the judges in Macau are not necessarily Chinese nationals, they still have deep connections to Macau, to the society there. Macau's Apex Court, the TUI, is a small panel of only three members. The Macau Basic Law requires that the president of the tribunal be a Chinese national, but says nothing about um, citizenship or nationality requirements of the other members. Unlike the Hong Kong Basic Law, there is no constitutional provision regarding the invitation of foreign judges to sit on the TUI on a, on a specifically temporary basis. Instead, the general provision that I just described, Article 87, applies to all Macau courts equally. Now, while no foreign judge has ever been imported into Macau on a temporary basis to the TUI in the way that occurs in Hong Kong, the constitutional practice has still been that one member of the court 
um, be a Macau resident who is a Portuguese national, in other words, a non-Chinese. The role of the overseas judges in Hong Kong, as I will explain shortly, has been relatively controversial. This has not been the case, however, in Macau. Now, part of this is due to the different role the judges there play. A civil law system like Macau's does not depend on judicial interpretation of the law um, to the same extent. And so the role that any judge can play in law or policymaking is therefore significantly more limited, regardless of their citizenship. Nonetheless, in 2019, Macau amended its judicial organization framework law to prevent any non-Chinese national from hearing national security related cases. Hong Kong makes use of overseas judges, but in a much different way. The 1984 joint declaration between the UK and China stated that not only could non-Chinese national judges serve at all levels of the court system, but the Court of Final Appeal, the apex uh, court of Hong Kong, would be able to invite judges from other common law jurisdictions to sit as required, in other words, on a temporary basis. And this language was subsequently duplicated into Article 82 of the Basic Law, as you can see on the screen. The system by which these overseas judges would be used became known as the 4 plus 1 model. Under it, the Court of Final Appeal would be composed of the Chief Justice, who the basic law requires uh, to be a Chinese national with no right of abode elsewhere, three permanent members from Hong Kong, uh, but with no limitations regarding their citizenship or nationality, and one member drawn from one of two um, different panels. One of these panels would be uh, composed entirely of senior judges drawn from other common law jurisdictions. Under the first Chief Justice, uh, Andrew Lee, a constitutional convention developed under which um, virtually every case would be heard by a bench that included one overseas member. Now, these overseas judges have no connection to Hong Kong at all beyond their professional role. They are hired on renewable three-year contracts and are typically flown into Hong Kong for a few weeks each year to hear um, the cases to which they have been assigned. So this is really quite different than the use of foreign judges in Macau. The panel from which the overseas judges are currently drawn is composed of 14 members, all regarded as of the very highest caliber. There is not, however, tremendous diversity to their backgrounds. All are white, and only two are women. Indeed, they are the first women to sit on the CFA in any capacity. There are nine Britons, all of whom are Oxbridge educated, four Australians, and one Canadian. So why did the joint declaration and subsequently the basic law set up this uh, admittedly unusual system? Various arguments have been put forth over time, including those regarding capacity, increased internationalization of decisions, access to resources, and so on. And these are the ones that has, are historically put forth um, for the small microstates of the South Pacific that import judges too, but they're not really applicable in a wealthy, well-developed jurisdiction like Hong Kong. Certainly, even if they were valid during the run-up to 1997, it's very difficult to say that they still hold sway um, after two decades of practice uh, on the Court of Final Appeal now. So really, I think the only valid justification that, that can still be put forth for the existence of the judges is the symbolic role that they play under the one country two systems model. And in this sense, they help to mark the separation um, between Hong Kong's judicial system and that of the mainland, and to communicate the maintenance of that separation, um, both domestically and internationally. At the same time, I think it is important to accept that importing judges in this manner, especially from a, a former colonial ruler or its former colonial possessions, uh, raises issues connected to the national sovereignty. And so, as ever, we come to attention inherent in granting Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy under PRC sovereignty, um, given the radically different approaches to questions of law and justice that are adopted by the two systems. Current permanent justice uh, Falk has described his overseas colleagues as, quote, canaries in the coal mine, by which he means, should the court of final appeal have its independence threatened, then presumably the overseas members would not continue to take positions upon it. And there is precedent for this concept. For instance, in 2006, um, all of the overseas judges on the Fiji courts of appeal resigned following a coup, 
claiming that the Chief Justice was improperly interfering in their work in favor of the new government. Likewise, the resignation of Australian Geoffrey Ames as Chief Justice of Nauru in 2014 was an important signal there that the uh, rule of law was under threat from an overbearing executive. This concern about undue pressure is not new. Uh, Tang and Ching suggest a driving force behind the initial adoption of the overseas judging model was a, quote, widespread fear that local judges could be subject to pressure from China after 1997, whereas presumably the overseas judges would not. Yashkai has also pointed to discussions during the 1980s and 90s um, that suggested the overseas judges might enhance the court's prospects of independence. Now, this shouldn't be read to imply that the local judges are, in fact, less independent, but I think rather that the presence of the overseas judges contributes to the perception of the independence of the court, as I said, both domestically and internationally. The overseas judges themselves seem acutely aware of this aspect to their role. Former overseas judge Anthony Mason, for instance, observed that, quote, it probably gives a degree of reassurance to the international community that you have overseas judges of international reputation on the court. Current overseas judge and former president of the UK Supreme Court, um, Lord Newberger has spoken of this reputational aspect too, explaining that he and his colleagues would only continue to take positions on the CFA if they were confident in its independence. But while the inclusion of the overseas judges model in the basic law is certainly a logical decision in the context of handover, and as I said, the dramatically different approaches to questions of judicial independence between the two systems, I think it is important to accept that their role does implicate questions of sovereignty. Remember that we're not simply talking about judges with dual citizenship or dual nationality. Uh, the overseas judges are only brought in for a few weeks each year to hear cases. They are not connected um, to Hong Kong in any way beyond that. As McFarland says, um, this is because judging, especially in a common law system, is deeply bound up with important social, cultural, and political matters. The places from which Hong Kong imports its overseas judges do not, of course, return the favor. So there, there is this, this fundamental tension offered up by the presence of the overseas judges on Hong Kong's courts of final appeal. On the one hand, yes, they communicate domestically and internationally the ongoing independence of the court, but on the other, at the same time, they represent something of an uncomfortable colonial echo with implications for national sovereignty. And the national security law, I think, really highlights this tension. When the new national security law was announced, but before the text of it had been released, a number of commentators argued that Hong Kong should follow the model established in Macau and ban all non-Chinese nationals from hearing cases brought under the new law. Um, recall that the basic law itself does not mandate the use of the overseas judges in all cases. It only says that the CFA may invite them as required, and then under Andrew Lee, a convention was adopted um, by which uh, the common practice was they would sit on every um, or almost every case. But while consideration was no doubt given to, to formally banning overseas judges from hearing national security cases, in the end, um, the text of the national security law does not follow Macau's lead. However, it does contain provisions that I think may ultimately have a similar effect. The new law provides that there will be a special subset of the existing judges at all levels designated to hear cases brought under it. These judges are to be selected by the chief executive, though she or he may consult with the new National Security Committee and the Chief Justice before deciding. Note that this is quite different from the normal nomination procedure for judges in Hong Kong, uh, under which the chief executive nominates judges upon the recommendation of a committee chaired by the chief justice. The law also provides that any judge who has behaved or spoken in a way deemed to endanger national security cannot be appointed, but it's unclear who would be responsible for making a, uh, that determination or how um, it could be challenged. Furthermore, um, notwithstanding the fact that the basic law states that English may be used in the courts, 
only the Chinese version of the national security law is the authentic text. The English version is described as being provided only for reference. I think it would be pretty straightforward for the chief executive in making uh, her or his decision about appointments to hear cases um, to note that as questions of interpreting the law would no doubt rise in its application, um, fluency in Chinese would be a basic requirement for appointment. And this would, as far as I know, um, eliminate the possibility of any of the overseas judges from being appointed. The way these provisions have been constructed can, in my view, be interpreted as uh, essentially a strategic attempt by the drafters of the national security law to sidestep the overseas judges whilst maintaining the reputational benefits their presence bring. Um, in other words, removing the input of non-nationals into national security law cases without killing the canary. As I have suggested, I don't think it's unreasonable to argue that non-citizens should not hear cases related to national security. Uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, and so on, do not invite judges from Hong Kong or from anywhere else to sit on their courts in any capacity whatsoever, let alone to consider matters of state. But the historical role of the overseas judges in representing and communicating the difference between the two systems is also valuable and cannot be simply ignored. An explicit ban on their participation in national security cases, even if done for what, as I've said, I think are probably fair considerations of sovereignty, would absolutely be interpreted both domestically and internationally as a significant blow to the judicial autonomy of Hong Kong. This does not, of course, mean that the attempt by the national security law to thread this needle will be successful. As we know, there's huge international attention on Hong Kong at the moment, and the law itself continues to come under significant criticism. If it turns out that the law is used to punish or deter not only serious national security threats, but also non-violent expressions of dissent, then the overseas judges may find that they come under pressure to resign from within their home jurisdictions. And having the judges resign would, of course, have the same effect on the perception of Hong Kong's judicial independence as if they had been explicitly removed. Let me conclude by saying that even though the national security law does not explicitly bar the overseas judges from hearing matters under it, I think its various provisions help to ensure that the result will be the same. For the reasons I've said, as an isolated principle, I don't think it's a real problem in and of itself to prevent non-nationals from hearing national security cases. However, we must also remain conscious of the context in which the system of the overseas judges was created in the first place. The very real differences in approaches to law and justice between the two systems are in part collapsed by the national security law in the context of questions related to national security. What the long-term implications of that for the one country, two systems model um, is something that is not yet clear, but obviously is uh, worth paying attention to. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. And again, um, my apologies that I'm not able to deliver it uh, to you live. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, to my colleague Stuart Hargraves for his intervention. Uh, unfortunately, he could not be with us today. So if I may, I will pass on the baton to my colleague, Professor Mitchell, and uh, ask him to deliver his presentation in about 15 minutes. I will send a reminder. Over to you, Ryan. OK, thanks uh, very much, uh, Mara, for your introduction. And uh, thanks to Stuart, albeit remotely. I'll have to convey my thanks to him later, I guess. Um, for his excellent presentation. Um, so we're switching gears now uh, in line with the focus of this project, which is on constitutional law in greater China. Um, and so we're now moving on to discuss uh, constitutional law in the mainland, uh, the PRC constitution. And so in uh, these brief remarks, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the uh, evolution of the Chinese constitution, although of course, uh, only be able to give a very general account, but hopefully we can uh, kind of identify some key issues that uh, are really sort of at the forefront of questions about the future of the PRC constitution 
uh, as well. So um, we'll be looking backwards in order to look forwards. Um, just to start out with these images, uh, on the left is a photo from a recent celebration of Constitution Day, uh, which was instituted in 2014 as a new holiday celebrating the Constitution um, and its uh, legitimacy and its perceived importance. Um, and on the right is a constitutional oath being taken by a high level uh, government slash party official, uh, Li Jianshu, who is uh, the chairman of the standing committee of the National People's Congress and thus of the organ which is uh, technically supreme in the uh, PRC constitutional framework. Um, okay, so uh, just to start out, looking back, um, the very first uh, constitution, written constitution uh, in China was uh, issued in 1908. It was called the uh, Outline of a Constitution by Imperial Appointment or the uh, Imperially Sanctioned uh, Promulgated Constitutional Outline. And it basically followed German and Japanese models to attempt to create a very robust um, legalized bureaucracy under a strong monarch who would not be uh, have their power limited by the document per se, but would have that power channeled into formal expressions. So we see that the document starts with this statement of the strength of the executive, the importance of the executive, uh, that the great Qing emperor rules for all, will rule for uh, all generations, will be eternally respected, his sacred dignity may not be violated. Um, however, uh, very soon after, you do get these sort of formal constraints, right? Not necessarily limits, but perhaps, uh, again, ways of channeling that power. Um, so we see that uh, deter already determined laws, unless they're submitted to the legislature, may not be revised or abolished through an imperial order, right? So we see that there is a limit being placed on the emperor to a certain extent, some degree of checks and balances being introduced, although ultimately the emperor's own position is uh, inviolable and also the emperor will be able to appoint and remove officials to ultimately achieve as well as the idea of including obligations in the document that subjects have certain legal obligations to the state as well as rights conferred by the state. Um, of course, the fall of the Qing dynasty meant that that constitution was never really actually implemented. Um, the next constitutional document that was uh, issued that was significant was in 1912, the Provisional Constitution for the Republic of China. And here you get uh, a shift in the direction of more legalized governments, more constraints on the powers of current government actors, of course. Um, you have uh, lists of the different branches of government and what their specific functions are supposed to be. Uh, you get more robust protections of uh, civil and political rights uh, becoming focused on for the first time. And you get the very first mention of popular sovereignty. Um, the idea that the sovereignty of the Republic of China belongs to the national citizenry as a whole, it's, as it's stated. And this is not only the first mention of popular sovereignty, but actually the first mention of sovereignty at all um, in any uh, legal text in China. Um, there, the term had simply not been used to refer to the power of the emperor under the old system. Um, of course, due to political reasons, the uh, documents, uh, uh, constitutional documents starting in, in 1912 and continuing over the next uh, three decades were not fully implemented. Um, and so under the uh, Guomindang uh, rule, uh, various periods, as well as under the warlord rule that preceded it, there were a number of constitutional texts issued, many of which were really quite interesting in terms of their contents. For instance, looking again to the German example uh, for the inclusion of social uh, and economic rights uh, in the 1930s. However, these constitutions were again sort of uh, subject to uh, political realities and were not fully implemented. Um, the 
one that was uh, most uh, effective in a formal sense was the 1946 Constitution. It was the longest and the most robust. It established a very detailed new structure for the government following the end of the Second World War. Um, however, it was followed uh, just a year after its enactment by the temporary provisions effective during the period of communist rebellion, which was uh, basically did not cancel the effect of the entirety of the Constitution but it did separate out the figure of the executive, Jiang, Jiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jiexu, uh, and gave him a special status, uh, including the abolition of term limits, including a number of other special powers uh, related to appointments uh, and dismissal of officials, relating to direct enforcement of emergency legislation that were um, not foreseen in the original document that had been enacted a year earlier. And those remained in place until 1991. Um, those special executive powers. So moving on to the PRC constitution against this background, um, we, uh, there are four PRC constitutions that were enacted, one in 1954, 1975, 1978, and 1982, which is the constitution that is currently in force. Um, and so we'll talk very briefly uh, in a summary fashion about this process of evolution of these uh, PRC constitutional texts. Um, basically, just talking about their kind of main features and some of the interesting changes, the 1954 Constitution uh, followed the Soviet Union model very closely, including establishing the NPC, the legislature, as the supreme organ of government, um, which was after the Soviet model, um, and not including any strong uh, doctrine of separation of powers or checks and balances between different branches of government, um, and also not directly addressing the role of the Communist Party in governance, right? Although obviously in the Soviet Union, as in the PRC, this is a major topic, but not one that is addressed in the constitutional text. Um, the 1975 constitution arose uh, as part of this general cultural revolution uh, trend of rejecting the established forms to the extent that they already existed in the Communist uh, Party's uh, previous governance structure. And that included eliminating major aspects of the uh, existing constitutional framework, including even the office of the president itself, the idea of an executive-led government, which had been so included in the 1954 constitution, was actually eliminated uh, in 1975. Of course, this is ironic because we think of this as being the high Maoist period, that Mao's word was law, but that's perhaps precisely why uh, the actual constitutional figure of the executive was not really required because all of this was happening extra legally in any case. Um, one interesting and, and quite actually significant feature that was included in terms of rights in 1975 was uh, this uh, really strongest rights related language in the document, which was about these rights to uh, speak out freely, air views fully, hold great debates, and write big character posters, right? So of course we think of the activities of the Cultural Revolution, of this idea that it was obviously, there was a lot of political persecution occurring, but it was decentralized political persecution and people were encouraged to get out there and struggle and air their own interpretation of party doctrine, which was supposed to align with that of uh, Mao himself and not to go through the formal channels of governance, uh, but also not even of the party itself, right? Um, so the end of the Cultural Revolution uh, with Mao's death led to this situation in which there was this turn to try and find new ways of running uh, the governance of China, as well as a new constitutional framework there was a 1978 constitution that was initiated in order to bring back some of these formal institutions from 1954. Um, but it also kept in place the, uh, uh, these rights that were specified in the 1975 document while adding freedom of speech, correspondence, press, assembly, association, procession, demonstration, and the freedom to strike, right? So actually quite robust set of rights in 1978. Um, there were uh, political movements, sort of uh, democratic movements that emerged very shortly afterwards where people really made use of these rights, um, despite the fact that they were indeed, you know, cracked down upon to a certain extent um, based on the 
political, uh, factional politics, especially of the time. Um, the 1982 constitution uh, came about with this sort of assertion of a more clear plan for how uh, China's state-led modernization in the reform and opening up era was supposed to unfold. And we see that there is a much stronger emphasis on rule of law in the document, on the idea of the constitution itself as an authority uh, that cannot be uh, overridden by any other, supposedly any other, um, government actor or political organization, um, and also the beginnings of an inclusion for protection of rights regarding private economic activity, especially, which is crucial for the ideas of modernization that we see during this uh, period, beginning to really be formally included in the legal system. The NPC is, again, the highest organ of state power. And uh, interestingly, we look at those rights from 1975 and 1978, and we can see that we have uh, rights included to freedom of speech, of the press, of assembly, association, procession, and of demonstration. But what's missing, uh, we no longer have the right to strike or the right to write big character posters like cultural revolution style protest posters or struggle posters. So we see that actually um, some limits on political organization are introduced in 1982 whereas they had not been present over the previous uh, half decade. Um, so now just to talk very briefly about some of the uh, amendments uh, that we see subsequently to the 1982 constitution. Um, in 1988, uh, we saw inclusion of protections for private economic activity and land transfer in particular, key to stabilizing the economy and providing a legal foundation for further growth. Uh, in 1993, there was an official endorsement of the idea that the market economy has a legitimate status uh, under law and it should be protected, although obviously within the parameters of the government's overall policies. Um, in 1999, you again see amendments focused on adding specific protections of, uh, of further uh, economic related rights uh, on the individual level um, without going into the details of those at the moment. Um, but we also see uh, on the ideological level, the inclusion for the first time of an endorsement of the uh, concept of rule of law, fa zhi. Some translate as rule by law in the Chinese context. Um, I personally, I don't think it's necessarily that important a distinction because there's always a wide spectrum of meanings for a concept like this. But uh, we see this is actually not really fully endorsed uh, as such in uh, the constitutional text until 1999. In 2004, we get another major addition, uh, and again, a somewhat paradoxical one. At the same time, you get uh, more language protecting private property. You get the first official uh, protection of human rights uh, mentioned in the constitutional text. And you, uh, at the same time, get the uh, official inclusion of um, party ideology in the form of Deng Xiaoping theor uh, theory, and also the three represents theory of Jiang Zemin, uh, his successor. Uh, at the head of the party. Um, and uh, then we see our more recent set of amendments which were focused on uh, the uh, ending of term limits for uh, the executive, for the, uh, the state chairman, right, Bo Jia Zhu Xi, um, as well as the official inclusion of the Communist Party's leadership role in the text of the Constitution. Um, the creation of the new national supervision system to police corruption, among other changes. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, I think it's worth talking about a few forms of influence that we can talk about constitutions having in general, and then ask uh, which of these uh, apply to the PRC constitution uh, and to what extent. So uh, in terms of overall constitutional influence, you have uh, judicial constitutionalism in the sense that is uh, attributed to the Hong Kong Basic Law, but also to you know uh, written constitutions in uh, all many countries around the world, beginning in the Anglo-American world uh, with the U.S. Constitution as the first fully judicial constitution, meaning you can sue based on constitutional rights against the government and have that heard in court, and the court's decision is supposed to bind the government. So that is simply uh, not the case with regards to the PRC Constitution. You cannot file a lawsuit based on the Constitution. You can file administrative lawsuits based on infringement of specific rights, 
against specific um, government bodies. However, those are handled through a separate uh, area of law, administrative law, not via the Constitution itself as a legal text. Um, you uh, also, in addition to judicial constitutionalism, you have political constitutionalism, which is where a constitution is used by government actors among themselves and among political actors in a society to define what, what is the proper structure, the powers and the rules by which governance should be undertaken, right? So it's really more about a constitutional discourse and about institutions setting the rules among one another, carving out territory, sometimes struggling over certain interpretations of the law, but really not about a, a citizen filing a lawsuit and having the judge then be the voice of authority telling you this is the meaning of the text, right? It's more about an interplay between political actors. Um, and then finally, you have popular constitutionalism, which is where you have uh, people outside of government, people with no official status, just the people, uh, making use of the constitutional text in order to advance their own arguments or demands or protests, in some cases, on government, right? And so these are all meanings that can be attributed to a constitution. Um, we can ask which of these uh, can be attributed to the PRC constitution. I just want to very briefly raise two different points of view. Um, two scholars uh, based in the mainland, uh, Jiang Shigong uh, at uh, uh, Peking University at Beida and Gao Chenxi at Beihang University, um, they both advocate an idea of political constitutionalism as the true model of what is constitutionalism in China. And Jiang Shigong basically says that we have a political constitutional system where the sort of core theme across decades since 1949 or since 1954 has been that the leadership of the party is central. And so the constitution, if it doesn't address that, doesn't match the reality of, the, of constitutional life in the PRC, and so there's a need to amend the constitution to clarify the party's role. And that would actually both clear things up and also make the, the party itself more of a formal part of governance. Gao Chuanxi disagreed. Um, he argued that the sort of key theme uh, throughout all of China's constitutional history has been the need and the desire and the struggle for a supreme legislature representing the will of the people. And so he argues that the National People's Congress is what really plays this role uh, in the PRC constitutional framework and that the constitutional text should be uh, reflecting that supremacy of the NPC as an institution versus both any other part of government as well as the party itself, um, which is not intended to be a formal part of the governance system of the country, but rather uh, exert informal influence over government. So you have Jiang arguing for supremacy of the party. That should be what's the core of the constitutional text uh, as it's interpreted, as well as at how it should be written. And you have uh, Gao arguing that it should be the legislature, the NPC. Um, okay, so, uh, and just wrapping up here, um, it's actually, I think the last thing I wanna mention is just that it's probably wrong to simply dismiss the PRC constitutional framework as being not judicially, not having a judicial constitutionalist system at all. In fact, there are aspects of constitutional practice or at least of legal uh, administration uh, and interpretation that do draw on judicial constitutionalist forms. Um, and those include things such as issuing the uh, guiding cases uh, from the Supreme People's Court where there have been you know, over a hundred such cases which provide top level guidance in various different areas of law, including dealing with rights related issues, telling the courts that they must uniformly deal with such issues in a certain manner, sometimes providing reasons why that's the case, although sometimes not really saying much about the reasons, um, but basically providing this role similar to that of a, of a Supreme Court in, or a constitutional court in uh, a judicial constitutional system. Again, usually each decision being in a much more narrow range of issues and probably the key distinction, this is prompted spontaneously, sua sponte, by the Supreme People's Court, not by a citizen appeal to the court uh, or a, a bit filing a lawsuit. Um, and then finally, uh, another form of semi-quasi-judicial constitutionalism that we see uh, that reflects constitutionalist discourse is in uh, other areas of law, including administrative law, but then also perhaps most notably recently, the civil code, 
which uh, is just regulating people's rights in private law um, uh, exchanges, such as relating to contracts or torts, et cetera, but where the rights that are specified in the civil code have been then made the basis for administrative lawsuits in other areas, and where we see lots of scholars actually appealing to the principles of the code and to the rights contained within the code, such as personal dignity rights, et cetera, uh, on the basis of arguments that they raise in totally different fields, including in relation to the Constitution itself. So um, again, uh, I think it's uh, very accurate to say that we see a hybrid of these different forms of influence in the PRC uh, attached to this constitutional text, and that it is very much uh, an important text, even though you can't actually go and file a lawsuit based on it uh, whenever you'd like to. Um, and I'll wrap it up there, thanks. Thank you so much, Ryan. Excellent presentation, I've learned a lot. Um, may I move on to my colleague, Professor Bui, uh, for his presentation? Over to you, son. So you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Unmute. Okay. Do you hear me now? Okay. Okay, so thank you again. Uh, so um, my, topic, my topic is on the English language uh, writings about China's constitution by competitive constitutional law scholar. So two constitutional law scholars, uh, Wen Chen Chang and David Law, said that um, <clears throat> um, given the relative health of both Chinese law and competitive law, we can expect that there are many English uh, language uh, writings about China's constitutional law from the competitive perspective, but in reality, uh, not very much. Uh, so why? And they uh, suggest that there are three reasons because the field focuses very much on uh, two distinctions in Western Europe. Second, because the fields focus on English speaking uh, countries. And third, they focus very much on a judicial review. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we, this, they believe that they are not uh, very much uh, English uh, language uh, scholarship on China's uh, constitution. But uh, in the last five years, um, we can see um, a better scholarship on, on um, competitive scholarship on China constitution. By China's constitution here, I focus mainly on uh, the socialist constitution in mainland China. And so we, we see uh, the socialist constitution in mainland China has been studied by leading competitive constitutional law scholars published in major uh, law review and journals and included in important edited volume or books. So the key question of uh, my, my presentation is how and why has competitive constitutional law scholarship had a greater engagement with China's constitution. And uh, my, my argument is that the competitive engagement with China's constitution is shaped by two conditions. The increasing social political significance of China's constitution and the recent jurisdictional, substantive, ideational expansion of competitive constitutional law. So now I'm going to, to, to explain that um, argument. I will focus on the how question first and then I move to the why question uh, later. How? So here is the list of recent, in the last important publications by competitive constitutional law scholars in English 
about China's constitution in the last uh, five uh, years. Uh, here, I don't focus on like just, uh, in, of course, there are many English writings about China constitution, but I focus mainly on uh, competitive law uh, scholarship. And we can see here uh, many um, uh, important uh, publications, and we can analyze this uh, list uh, from three angles, the scholars, the topics, and the venues. In terms of scholars, so we can see um, uh, there are scholars from different jurisdictions, from mainland China, for example, uh, Yan Lin uh, and Zhang Guifan, from Taiwan, for example, uh, Wen Chen Chang, from Hong Kong, for example, uh, Professor Albert Chen and Fu Waling, from the US, for example, Professor Tom Ginsburg and Mila Bertis. Uh, in terms of uh, topics, we can see a range of uh, topics uh, about China's constitution that has been discussed from a competitive uh, perspective. First, uh, the first topic is on presidential limit um, uh, evasion. In, in, that they also engage with uh, the 2018 amendment. The second is uh, uh, papers focus very much on the, uh, the amendment, the 2018 amendment, constitutional archetypes, uh, the debate, uh, constitutional debate in China, uh, the role of the legislature in constitutional interpretation in China. Uh, the diversion, the, the difference between socialist constitutionalism in China and in Vietnam. Uh, Chang Kui Fan's writing about the history of uh, the constitutional history in China, and Professor Albert Chan's writing about constitutional values uh, in three Chinese societies, including um, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So, a range of topics. In terms of venues, so you, you can see the um, China's uh, constitutional law uh, issues has been published in leading law review journals, uh, journal, law reviews such as Columbia Law Review uh, or the Vanderbilt Journal of International Law or some peer review journals such as American Journal of Competitive Law, the International Journal of Constitutional Law. Uh, so, uh, you, Topics also include in major important collections in competitive constitutional law, such as the Cambridge book on competitive constitutional law just last year, and another book on uh, um, uh, competitive constitutional theory. So that was uh, the scholars' topics and, and venues. Now I turn to the ways or the most that uh, scholars uh, discuss uh, Chinese constitutional issues from a competitive perspective. So I will identify three uh, models in which scholars uh, engage with uh, China's constitution. The first is called concept formation. Uh, scholars create new concepts in order to understand Chinese constitutional law. For example, Chia's uh, create the concept uh, called constitutional entrepreneurs, which means that Chinese citizens use constitutional argument to influence the creation of new uh, policy. Wan Chen Chang and David Law create the concept called constitutional dissonance, which means that China's constitution operates as a constructive evidence for meaningful constitutional debate and discourse. Um, another model to engage with uh, China's constitution is called the council inference or small end studies. So we have two, model, two models here, the most similar cases. Uh, Professor Fu Hualing and Dr. Bu He compare uh, the difference between China's constitution and Vietnamese constitution. Uh, in contrast, Lin Yan and Tom Ginsburg 
compare China, the similar uh, features between China constitution with the constitution in UK and the US in the sense that in three examples, in three jurisdictions, the legislature play an important role in constitutional interpretation, not only the court. And finally, we have large end studies. Uh, large end studies refer to the macro studies uh, to identify the global constitutional trends. And scholars use China to illustrate some global constitutional uh, development um, change. Uh, Mila studies for about term limit evasion also engage with uh, uh, China's um, constitutional amendment in, in, 19, uh, in 2018. David Law studies three models of uh, uh, three constitutional models using the preamble. Uh, he studied every constitutional preamble and he identifies um, three constitutional models the liberal model, the universal model, and the statist model. Universal model, for example, uh, Australia, uh, the universal model, for example, South Africa, and the statist constitutional models, for example, China. And he used uh, Ch China's constitutional preamble uh, to illustrate that statist model in the sense that China's constitutional preamble um, suggest that the state is the embodiment of the distinctive community and uh, the uh, vehicle for the achievement of the community's goals. Now I turn to explain uh, why uh, we have more and more scholarships in competitive constitutional law uh, focusing on or engaging with uh, China's constitution. So there are two reasons. The first reason is because of the dynamic of China's constitution. Uh, tai Su Chang and Tom Risberg, for example, uh, they argue that China's constitution already carry much more political weight than scholars have previously given it credit for. Indeed, at the highest level of the party state, that recent developments, uh, and they refer to the 2018 amendments, have only further bolstered its influential influence and significance. Uh, so the, the the social and political significance of China's constitution attract uh, the attention of uh, competitive constitutional law scholar. So that, that reason is referred to the China's constitution. Another dynamic is um, because of the field of competitive law, competitive constitutional law. Competitive constitutional laws, traditional substantive ideational expansions create the condition for the field to engage with non-Western liberal constitutions such as China's constitution. So now I will focus on, uh, I will explain uh, different uh, factors. The first is the jurisdictional expansion. In the past, uh, in the last few years, competitive constitutional law has incrementally expanded its jurisdictional scope beyond Western and similar institutional settings. One example is the organization of uh, um, a big mega conference of the International Society of Public Law in Asia, and particularly in Hong Kong in 2018. And the publication of the special issue on, China, on, on, on Asia in um, the International Journal of Constitutional Law, which is the leading journal uh, in the field. This indicate that the field is now not limited to Western uh, countries, but expand to, to non-Western uh, jurisdictions. The jurisdictional expansion renders competitive constitutionalists reach out to non-liberal institutional settings 
including uh, China. The second reason is uh, the substantive expansion of uh, competitive constitutional law. In recent years, competitive constitutional law have, uh, has expanded its substantive scope discussing a range of non-judicial topics, such as constitution making, constitutional amendment, legislative uh, development of constitutional law. And China's recent development equal, uh, resonate with that competitive uh, issues. Consequently, the fields um, expansion to non-judicial issues render countries without judicial constitutional review like China become more attractive site for competitive studies. Uh, finally, there is an ideational expansion of uh, competitive uh, constitutional law scholarship. Um, for many years, the field just focused very much on uh, liberalism and that the system, constitutional system uh, supported by Western liberalism. But uh, recently, uh, we can see the field expand to non-liberal uh, communitarian uh, constitutional systems like Singapore and other non-liberal uh, setting. And this is why a leading scholar in the field, Professor Mark Chosnet, said that we should pluralize our thinking about constitutional issue beyond uh, liberal uh, uh, thinking. So the ideational expansion enables the field to engage with constitutional systems underpinned by non-liberal ideas, like socialist ideas, such as um, the constitutional system in, in, in China. So, um, in conclusion, uh, this talk I explained the recent engagement of the competitive constitutional law scholarship uh, with China's constitution, but we should not overstate that engagement. A range of China's constitutional questions have not yet been substantively studied within a competitive constitutional law framework. For example, constitution, constituent power, participation in constitution making, the limit of constitutional amendment power, legislative constitutional rights, and the international dimensions of national constitution. And for that reason, this handbook uh, seeks to engage with these competitive issues in order to further contribute to the studies of uh, China's constitutional law and also for competitive constitutional law generally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sun. Fantastic presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start collecting on the chat a few questions. So if members of the audience have questions for Professor Mitchell and Professor Bui, could you please type them in the chat? So Bonnie, if you can open that up. Uh, in the meantime, as we get the ball rolling uh, with questions from the audience, I'm going to abuse my position as chair and ask my colleague a question. So what do you think are the most important trends and development in this comparative project that you're undertaking? What do you think are gonna be the hot areas? Um, well, I guess I'll hand the response over to Son in just a second. Um, but I think from my perspective, one aspect that we are certainly um, looking at in this project, and that is probably gonna be of great interest to uh, people in this comparative sense is this question of the nature of the executive, the role of the executive uh, in the constitutional framework in different constitutions. Um, you know, this was something that we, uh, as we saw in that overview um, uh, during my presentation, this is something that has really been struggled with over the course of the PRC's own constitutional history or going back before the founding of the PRC. Um, but it's also really something that we see around the world today, um, these, this 
sort of phenomenon, right, uh, in Western contexts and non-Western contexts of uh, these debates over executive power of the relationship of executives to other branches of government and questions about where these lines should be drawn, how formal uh, the rules constricting executives should be, how formal they need to be. Um, and, you know, we, we see this in the UK with regards to this uh, jurisprudence that starts to look like American style judicial review, um, all sorts of different contexts. So I think uh, the fact that this is, this is a major theme in recent developments in greater China as well is going to really make this um, a topic that will be of interest. Okay. Comparatively. Uh, so uh, four things. We tentatively divide the books, uh, the book into four sections and, and this also, also a, um, an attempt to contribute to the scholarship on competitive constitutional law. Four things, history, ideas, process, and institution. History, we, 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 uh, we consider constitutional history is an important area to explore in the future. The fields now focus very much on, on current contemporary issues, but not very much on historical issues, as my college already mentioned. Uh, mentioned on, on, on this, uh, the long history of uh, Chinese constitutional law. The second is ideas. We hope to move beyond liberal uh, foundations of uh, constitutional system to consider non-liberal uh, ideational systems, for example, socialism or Confucianism. Institutions, uh, we hope to move beyond judicial uh, Questions. Of course, we also consider many judicial issues here, but we also consider a range of political uh, institutions, for example, the legislature, the party, the political party, and the executive uh, branch. And finally, the process. Uh, we will consider a range of procedures issue, not only you know, the process of judicial review, but also the process of constitution making the process of concept and also the process of constitutional amendment and law making. Thank you so much, both of you. I have a question here in the chat. Thank you so much to our members of the audience for writing to me. And I have a question for uh, Professor Mitchell. Uh, do you think if there is any tension between the written constitution and unwritten constitution as conceived by Jiang Shigong and the role of the party constitution, and also between multiple sources of the unwritten constitution. Great. Well, I think that's um, an excellent question. And uh, I mean, I think the test as to whether or not there is uh, tension between those sources of law, if we're being, you know, sort of good and proper political constitutionalists, um, is not necessarily subjective but objective. So do we see any of that tension playing out in reality? And of course, um, given the media environment in China, you don't really see anything that happens behind the scenes with regards to tensions between different parts of government. Uh, but you do perhaps see that there is um, this sort of process by which uh, you've seen different types of changes emerge that are not all pointing in a single direction, right? So, of course, we do see under in the 2018 amendments um, that there is this first, uh, for the first time actually in the constitutional text itself, this uh, endorsement of the idea that the Communist Party has a leading role, right? And the leading role of the party is included in the constitutional text. Um, but if you look at the other events that are occurring at the same time, such as the, uh, the real focus on the civil code, that began around the same time as plans for constitutional revision, um, or slightly earlier, was completed slightly later, um, you see that that is actually uh, adding to a much greater formalization of the law, right? And so less of a reliance on unwritten law and less of a reliance on communist party uh, institutions being the ones to direct uh, judicial policy or the handling of specific issues in society. A lot of stuff that originally was not contained in any legal text is now contained in a legal text via the civil code. Of course, it only goes so far. It only covers a certain range of issues. 
Um, but so I think, uh, I think what we can draw from that is, you know, you look at these different phenomena, in one case, you have a, something seemingly deformalizing the law, pointing towards more political management and administration. And at the same time, you have other factors pointing in the other direction towards more formalization and more explicit rules contained in the legal standards themselves in different areas. So if that, that might indicate tension, um, it might indicate uh, actually agreement and compromise. Uh, I'm not sure that you can necessarily put a clear label on it like that, um, but uh, I think it, at the very least it indicates that what we're looking at is uh, incorporation of different approaches in different areas, right? So in the civil law formalization, in um, you know, these top level questions about things like term limits, uh, apparent deformalization, uh, and, uh, and so we have kind of the mixture of these different factors. Uh, and uh, probably that's something that we would see continue, right? So we would, we would see future developments, just you know, not being able to predict exactly what they will be, but we would not predict that things would go entirely in the direction of uh, formalization of the law uh, or in the opposite direction. Thank you very much, Ryan. I have um, a couple more questions in the chat. So this one, not specifically for any of you. So whoever wants to take this on. I am curious about the role of the formal PRC constitution and the NPC, because the NPC is said to be rubber stamp. Important agendas are decided by the Politburo Standing Committee before the meeting, and the NPC is only obliged to pass the bills, question mark. And the constitution is not the whole thing because the CCC power division is also important. Well, um, I can handle uh, a little stab at that first part about the NPC. Um, I think that that's obviously a, a good point. You know, if we look at the voting record of the NPC, uh, it has never rejected a bill that's been put before it. Um, However, uh, you know, sometimes there have been some protest votes, some no votes on things like Three Gorges Dam, for instance, had about a third of the delegates voting no, which was taken as a sufficiently out of ordinary uh, response that then the plans were actually modified because there had been this display of uh, some dissatisfaction, which is so rare uh, in the NPC. Um, so the, there, but in general, it is, um, it's fair to call it a rubber stamp in the sense that it will approve the legislation, the bills that come before it uh, officially, right? That come up for a vote. But the process by which the bills do come up for a vote is a different question. And a lot of that drafting is actually handled within the NPC itself, within uh, its uh, legislative uh, affairs committee and uh, among uh, the lawyers and other experts that are consultants to that process of drafting the legislation. So it's sort of a matter of, um, if we talk about you know, the power, the supremacy of the NPC, it's a question of how much of that process of lawmaking gets shifted into this body versus happening somewhere else and then being delivered to the body in the form of, you know, here's this bill uh, that has to come up for a vote. Um, so we do actually see some changes in that respect over time that point more towards the NPC's role being strengthened uh, uh, including kind of more formal constitutional review of prospective legislation um, being, uh, being handled within the NPC itself. Yeah, uh, just a quick point. So my view is that the, um, we can consider that question from uh, the perspective of uh, my legislative constitutional interpretation on the, on the relationship between the constitution and the legislature. Uh, the legislature will pass the law uh, to interpret constitutional provisions and to, to implement constitutional provision. Uh, for example, one amendment in, in China's constitution allow for private property. But how to implement that private constitutional right to private property? Uh, the legislature passed a law legislative, uh, the, the private property law. And in this case, we can uh, also, also uh, discuss uh, in, in a system that the court uh, don't have a constitutional review power, the legislature will play an important role 
in constitutional interpretation by lawmaking. Thank you very much, Son. I have a question for both of you, for our colleague, uh, Professor Stuart McManus from the History Department at CUHK. Hi, Stuart. So here we go. Uh, one, can one or, bo or both of you expand on the best way to understand the interplay between the judicial versus the administrative legal streams in socialist jurisdictions? Second, is there any value in talking about the Soviet Union either as a model or comparandum after the Sino-Soviet split? Well, I'll just start with the Sino-Soviet split. I'm sorry to jump ahead of you, Son. Um, no, no, you, 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 this is just gonna be a brief, uh, yeah. brief interjection. So on the Sino-Soviet split, um, the massive deformalization that we saw in the Cultural Revolution was really, of course, in part due to this split. There was a geopolitical dimension to, um, to these uh, domestic legal changes that we saw, and the rejection of the Soviet institutions was really um, a, a major aspect that we saw uh, throughout that whole period. Um, and so, you know, the courts were really, um, in some cases, went disused. In other cases, they were staffed en masse from retiring military officers. And so there was this huge cadre of judges uh, that were former, you know, military veterans, um, which uh, was sort of really reflecting this view uh, that was prevalent within, within the Communist Party of China at the time that, you know, the courts are really meant to be like the army, sort of following these top level policies and just implementing them at the ground level in their own respect, whether it's in judicial matters or in military matters. Um, after the end of the Cultural Revolution era, when we saw the beginning of reform and opening up, there was uh, actually, it's, it, it's fair to say, there was a return to some of the aspects of the Soviet Union's uh, model. And so there wasn't a total turn to Western uh, influences, Anglo-American influences, um, as has sometimes been the narrative that we see uh, in the West itself when we talk about China's reform. So the Soviet Union did continue to serve as a model even in the reform era. And, uh, and also you saw perhaps even more attention being paid to kind of in between jurisdictions, um, countries in the Soviet Union's orbit or is in Central Europe um, serving as models as well. So there was not a total abandonment of the Soviet influence. Okay. Uh, so I just take a general uh, view about the Soviet model and uh, maybe general about socialist uh, constitutions. Uh, my general view is that um, socialist constitutions, um, at, for example, in, in five countries, China, Vietnam, Cuba, Laos, and North Korea, they uh, currently, they don't uh, like, um, follow the original model of the Soviet model, uh, the, the original model of the Soviet constitution system. Uh, but they still keep the core features. They modify that one. Uh, just um, for example, we can identify some features. About, first is about the nature of the constitution. The, according to the Soviet model, the function of the constitution is not, not to limit the state power, but the constitution is, uh, the framework on uh, not only to organize the state power, but also to for social and economic development. So when the party change the political directions, the constitution will have to amend it to reflect that uh, uh, political and social and economic um, and direction. This is very socialist uh, style. Uh, Another feature, a socialist feature is um, what we call democratic, democratic centralism. In socialist constitution, um, we don't have a separation of power. Uh, so, and, and this also responds to your question about uh, how to explain the connection between the court and other branches. There's no separation of power, but they have the, the principle of uh, democratic centralism. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, the court, 
should be subordinate uh, and should be under the supervision of uh, uh, the legislature. And uh, another feature is um, the economy. There are many uh, constitutional provisions about the economy in socialist uh, 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 constitutions. Of course, they have some non-socialist values, for example, private property or foreign investment. But uh, to include a number of provisions about, about uh, the economy is also a feature of uh, the socialist, uh, uh, the Soviet uh, model. So um, just one additional point to address this question about the administrative and judicial systems and their relationship. Um, so uh, in, in administrative law, you do see um, initial uh, review of administrative decisions by the courts. There tends to be a good amount of deference, um, but uh, in general, when there are serious allegations uh, or when there's a, a claim that the administrative system, the administrative body has made a ruling that is not, doesn't have a rational basis, it's really actually quite similar in that sense to administrative law um, in a lot of other jurisdictions, uh, you do see the courts then getting to have the final say. And so in terms of the formal distribution of powers, it does very much lie with the court system as opposed to the administrative system when you're dealing with this area of law. Of course, the actual result of the cases is gonna depend a great deal upon the context and you know who, who's bringing what sort of case against which government body. Um, so in some areas where there's a really close match with government policy, such as better protection of environmental rights, you see a major increase in the kind of strong enforcement measures that you get from the courts against the respective government bodies at different levels. Uh, but if you have a, a set of claims that are coming in some other area that is not you know, clearly uh, ad adhering to sort of central government policy, then you'll get much less dramatic action uh, from the court system. Thank you very much, Ryan and Son, for your uh, great answers. Uh, I have a few more questions here, but I think we're running out of time. What would you like me to do? Should I wrap up or should I read them to you? Uh, okay, so I'll tell you what I have. I have a question for both of you, whether you think the constitution influences foreign investment, and then I have specifically a question for Professor Mitchell. What is Carl Schmitt's role in Jian Shigong's formulations of political constitutionalism? Maybe I take the foreign investment uh, first. Uh, most of um, socialist constitution have a provision about foreign investment uh, to, to uh, attract uh, uh, foreign, uh, may, they may have direct uh, provision about like the state will support foreign investment. Or they may have the indirect provisions, for example, they provide of private uh, property uh, or the right to do business. So this is also a way to attract uh, foreign uh, investments in, in, um, in socialist constitution. So my answer is yes, the, the socialist constitution do have uh, a play to attract foreign investment. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in terms of foreign investment as well, this actually this topic that we were just talking about with uh, the role of administrative law, as well as the kind of formal supremacy of the courts in, in terms of these sorts of litigation, also plays a significant role. Um, and so you see, you know, these kind of five-year plans that are issued within the court system, and they actually make it very, very clear and explicit that part of the reason why they should, they, there's a uh, sort of motive to more formally protect certain rights or at least to improve the procedural aspects of certain types of cases, especially in administrative uh, and commercial law, is in order to create a safe or a perceived safe investment environment for foreign companies, right? And so, of course, this is really a consistent through line through the past three decades starting in uh, the 1980s, uh, you know, even before Deng Xiaoping starts to really formulate these policies, you see that this idea that law is what creates the investment environment, and if we don't have a perceived fair and just legal system, we're going to miss out on a lot of foreign capital 
uh, and expertise, et cetera, uh, this is a, a major factor. Uh, and so you've seen this, especially in, you know, in intellectual property protections, um, that sort of thing, which have kind of steadily improved over the years. That's been very related to these central goals related to wealth creation and related to uh, these sort of central economic policies. So law is one part of this kind of overall set of strategies for maximizing development, national influence, national strength, et cetera. Um, with the question about Carl Schmitt's influence uh, on Jiang Shigong specifically, uh, I think uh, he's, he's a huge influence for Jiang Shigong uh, and for much of his recent thought. Uh, and uh, you see this especially in terms of this idea of what the constitutional text itself should be, what it should do. Um, he's a very committed political constitutionalist. Um, he does not believe that uh, judicial constitutionalism is appropriate for China really at all, uh, at least based on his statements uh, in, in most, of his, uh, most of his work over the past decade or so, uh, or a bit longer actually. Um, and uh, part of his reasoning for why he thinks that's the case is really drawn from Schmidtian concepts. Um, without doing a major introduction of Schmidt's thought um, here, which I don't think we have really time for, I mean, I, I think the main influence is simply that um, Schmidt, uh, in the context of Weimar Germany in the 1920s and 30s, introduced this idea of a very strong executive-led government um, that did not have a role for the judges, for the judiciary, as being the final interpreters of what the Constitution means. Uh, and you see a very similar point of view uh, expressed by Jiang Shigong who similarly thinks that there is a need for, uh, in his case, the party to serve as this kind of executive organization that has the final say on all legal questions, uh, including you know, major questions related to um, these national security type issues, uh, as well as you know, more minute and smaller issues uh, as well. But um, he, uh, Similarly to Schmidt, he would say that there's uh, the ability to delegate some of that decision making. It's uh, something that should always be the final decision lying with the supreme organ, the sovereign, or the voice of the sovereign, which he attributes to the Communist Party. Um, and, uh, and the more minor and minute decisions can be delegated, can be sent to the courts, etc. Um, so he's not really arguing for anything that's radically different from what we see today, but he's providing a very specific interpretation of it um, based on this kind of, you know, certain model of political constitutionalism. Thank you very much. And I think uh, I would draw the seminar to a conclusion here. Um, let me thank our wonderful speakers, my colleagues, uh, Stuart, uh, Ryan, and Son, for being here today and for organizing this seminar. I think it's been fantastic. Uh, let me thank the members of the audience for joining us today.